Okay, so good evening everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Uh, I'm Annie Zaniro, founder of the Magma Group, whose exhibition you can see all around you. Thank you everybody for coming to our symposium this evening. And also a big thanks to our host, Rebecca Fairman of Art House One Gallery. Uh, I would also like to thank our guest speakers, who I'm now going to briefly introduce. Um, the fuller details are in the handouts that you have. So we have Professor Michael Archer, who is Programme Leader of BA Fine Art at Goldsmiths. He was previously Head of School at the Ruskin, and before that taught at Chelsea and Wimbledon. He is a critic and writer on modern and contemporary art, and his work has appeared in Art Forum, <coughs> Art Monthly, and Freeze, and he has been editor of Art Scribe. Michael has curated for the Hayward Gallery twice and has been a member of the Art Purchasing Committee and Art Panel of the Arts Council and a jury member of the 2002 Turner Prize. Michael Glover, sitting over here, is art critic of the Independent, author, and poet. He has also contributed regularly to the Times, Financial Times, New Statesman and The Economist. He has been a London correspondent for Art News, New York City, and editor of the poetry forum, The Bow Wow Shop. His seventh collection of poetry is called <laughs> Only So Much, and he is author of a mem memoir, Headlong Into Pennylessness about growing up in a working class uh, suburb of Sheffield. His two new books are 111 Places in Sheffield You Should Not Miss and Playing Out in the Wildest Days. His next two books are detailed in your handouts. Anna McNay has an academic background in German and linguistics as teaching and then research fellow at Oxford University and then the Humboldt University Berlin and has an MA in History of Art from Birkbeck, London. She is assistant editor at Art Quarterly and former deputy editor for State Media. Anna is a freelance writer of essays, reviews and interviews and writes for publications such as Studio International and Elephant Magazine. She recently curated a show for members of Contemporary <coughs> British Painting and is currently working on two exhibitions for new art projects opening in January. Also need to thank our kind sponsors for supporting this exhibition and symposium and they are Telegreen Limited, the Boogaloo Bar and Radio Station, Balabusta Klesner Duo, Cosmova Restaurant and Professor Peter Swab who is in the audience of University College London. So just briefly to let you know what's coming, uh, our three speakers will give their presentations and then, at the end, there will be time for questions and answers, followed by refreshments. A um, couple of words about the purpose of our symposium is to explore Marshall McLuhan's well-known phrase, the medium is the message, by which he referred to mass media communication. We would like to explore to what extent his ideas do or do not apply to fine art. Anna McNay, in her catalogue essay, says, the Magma Group need and massage their materials until the message appears. And hence the title of the show and symposium, Massaging the Message. On which note, I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, Anna McNay. Thank you, Annie, and thank you, Rebecca. Um, not sure how I'm going to multitask here, but I've got to move the slides on, which I hope some of you might be able to vaguely see, and um, also double my sheets of paper without dropping them everywhere. Um, I also don't know how many of you have had chance to pick up a catalogue yet, and maybe look at the essay as well as the artwork, which obviously would be the first point of call, um, but I will be kind of talking along the lines of what I wrote in that essay, but without going into the artist's work, because I thought obviously that would come in, in the conversation perhaps afterwards. Um, so, as Annie said, um, I guess the starting point for the idea behind the exhibition was Marshall McLuhan's claim about the medium being the message. Um, in his book in nine, that he wrote in 1964, Understanding Media, the Extensions of Man, the Canadian Professor of Literature put forward the claim that in an age of electronic communications, 
the medium is the message. He claimed that the new media themselves redefine our perspectives and therefore that they themselves become the message and that to a certain extent the content becomes irrelevant. He said, the personal and social consequences of any medium, that is, of any extension of ourselves, result from the new scale that is introduced into our affairs by each extension of ourselves or by any new technology. The message of any medium or technology is the change or scale of pace or pattern that it introduces into human affairs. So, for example, if print technology created the public, as some people have claimed it did, so electronic technology created the mass. While the public consists of separate individuals walking around, each with their own point of view, electric technology, according to McLuhan, that is, demands that we abandon this fragmentary outlook since we are flooded with and surrounded by media. So it's a bit like being at the IMAX cinema or perhaps using virtual reality where you just cannot escape from the images all around you. In television, McLuhan explains in his image-led and co-authored follow-up publication, um, The Medium is the Massage, which we'll come to later, obviously written before VR was invented, he said, images are projected at you, you are the screen. The image wraps around you, you are the vanishing point. This creates a sort of inwardness or a sort of reverse perspective. And I guess it's this way in which um, what he said about the medium defining the message and determining the point of view can perhaps also carry over to looking at artworks um, because we're used to talking about different perspectives. And McLuhan, for example, suggests that um, he sees this as something like an inward perspective that might be common to Oriental art. That's his point of view anyhow. He also says, however, which I find a bit dubious, um, that the ear favours no particular point of view he says we're enveloped by sound, and I think maybe he has a point when we're listening to music, but if we're listening to speech, I would suggest that we have to actually focus on the specific um, oral input that we're listening to to define the words, to define the context, and you know, separate that out from background music, background radio, background conversations. So perhaps his claim already has a few areas um, of dispute. The idea of a development of technological medium engendering a change in our perspective and accordingly our understanding was of course not new to McLuhan. So the German Jewish philosopher and cultural critic Walter Benjamin had already noted in his The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, first published in 1936. With the advent of the first truly revolutionary means of reproduction, namely photography, art felt a crisis. It reacted with the theory of la pour la, or art for art's sake, which constitutes the theology of art. From it, there proceeded almost a negative theology in the form of the idea of pure art that rejected not only any kind of social function, but also any prompting by an actual subject. He added, because of the absolute weight placed on its display value, the work of art is becoming an image with entirely new functions. That is, the medium of the work of art is pivotal to, and indeed defines its purpose, reason and form. But does it, however, really contain the message? McLuhan advances his argument with the linguistic analogy that words and the meaning of words predispose a child to think and act automatically in certain ways. And this touches on a quite elementary linguistic hypothesis commonly referred to as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, um, alternatively known as linguistic determinism in its strong form or linguistic relativity in its weaker form. This is a stolen slide from the internet, I apologise. Um, but in the stronger form of linguistic determinism, it would suggest that the structures of language determine and are wholly necessary for um, basically shaping the way in which humans can think and that therefore without language you would be unable to think and you wouldn't be able to conceive of an object without first having a word for it. Um, this has largely been refuted, but the weaker form of linguistic relativity, which suggests that the um, structures of a language just influence the way in which the speakers of that language see the world, that still has some ground to it and is still debated a lot today. Um, Benjamin Lee Wolfe, so one of the two linguists behind the theory, says, 
we dis dissect nature along lines laid, out, laid down by our native language. Language is not simply a reporting device for experience, but a defining framework for it. So you can hear the um, kind of echo of what McLuhan later went on to say. The famous example often trotted out with relation to the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which I'm sure everyone's come across, is um, the also disputed <laughs> claim that Eskimo people have up to 150 words for snow in their language. Um, of course, you could also say, well, an artist might well have far more words referring to different colour terms than a quote. Again, this is a stolen slide, sorry for the normalising, <laughs> but normal people you know, might have far fewer terms. But does, does that mean that we normal people couldn't conceive of those colours. Um, as I say, so despite first being formulated in 1929, the theory is still much debated, although having been largely discarded in its stronger form, um, with a number of phenomenological examples to disprove it, not least the fact that we can translate between very differently structured languages, which wouldn't be possible if you couldn't conceive of those ideas without having the structure or the words first. There's also something known as the tip of the tongue phenomena. I don't suppose anyone will be able to, you might be able to read it. Um, there's this cartoon here. So it seems like language is absolutely necessary for the ability to think. We use language for the internal dialogues that go on inside our heads, as well as for expressing our, um, expressing our thoughts verbally to each other. It's like language is a, a <coughs> shoot, it's on the tip of my tongue. I know what I want to say, but I can't think of the right words. Well, then how can we say that language is really required for thinking? Um, and the process of language change and coining of new words. So this is my Eskimo saying, did you know that suburban white males have over 100 words for lawn? Which again refers back to the artist and the colours example. Uh, so surely then, there is more to the message than just the medium in which it's expressed. And even McLuhan himself has been known to say, I don't necessarily agree with everything that I say. <laughs> In terms of works of art, I guess McLuhan um, and also Benjamin approach the issue very much from the viewer's perspective or point of view. But what about the point of view of the artist, him or herself? Um, in Expressionism, which I guess is a form of art or a style of art um, very much the heart of the artist in the Magma group, uh, the artist seeks to present the world from a subjective perspective, distorting it radically for emotional effect in order to evoke certain moods or ideas. So it's not just thoughts. The critic Paul O'Kane suggests, painters are involved in a real material transformation and translation of one experience into another by means of a particular, more or less constant medium and process. So here he's using the analogy with translation, so the flip reverse of um, McLuhan using the analogy um, and again as with we've just seen with the language example by being able to translate from one medium to another then the medium cannot be the message in and of itself. Just to praise one of the points or the conclusions I guess of the essay uh, the artists of the magma group believe that an expressive use of feeling is as integral to a work of art as an underlying concept Equally important is the sensitive and empathetic handling of the artist's medium. Thus, while not denigrating the role of the medium in the ultimate work, they credit other aspects with having equal input in its success or failure and in the transmission of its message. Just as an idea might exist pre-linguistically, with the speaker then seeking out, coining or paraphrasing, um, paraphrasing in order to find the correct words or, me or medium through which to express it, so might an idea, and all the associated feelings, exist prior to their expression through a work of art, and an artist might choose his or her medium accordingly so as best to express them. In 1952, referring to the American action painters, the critic Harold Rosenberg wrote, What was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. The painter no longer approached his easel with an image in his mind. He went up to it with a material in his hand to do something to that other piece of material in front of him. The image would be the result of this encounter. In this gesturing with materials, the aesthetic too has been subordinated. Form, colour, composition, drawing are auxiliaries, any one of which 
or practically all, as has been attempted logically with unpainted canvases, can be dispensed with. What matters, always, is the revelation contained in the act. That is, both medium and message are simply protagonists in an encounter, and it is this encounter or act which reveals the ultimate truth of the work of art. Um, again, we might think of a linguistic analogy. So if you think of pragmatics versus segmentics, where pragmatics constitutes basically all that is added to the underlying logical semantic meaning by the act of the encounter between the speakers. If you think of the different ways in which one sentence may be interpreted depending on the context, so again, there's a, an example there, but a, a simpler example would be the statement, it's cold in here, which could just be a simple statement of fact, but it could also be a request for someone to put the heating on or to close the window, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of media or semiotics, the same message can also be conveyed very differently. So the idea of danger, we can have, for example, the skull and crossbones, which is um, an image, or we can have the colour red, we can have the word danger itself, we could have something like um, people running and shrieking, which would be a moving image, or police tape, which would be maybe, I don't know, socially loaded cultural object, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of art history, of course, we also have the use of motifs and symbols or iconography. So, for example, St. Jerome being shown with the, uh, with the lion, St. Peter with the keys, pomegranate perhaps being used as a symbol of fertility, and then, of course, Holbein's The Ambassadors, which is just full of <laughs> iconography. Um, so, again, these are effectively a form of semiotics, reinforcing the conclusion that the meaning, and, or the meaning of the work of art is not carried by the medium per se. Um, so, in his spin-off book, which I mentioned before, The Medium is the Massage, McLuhan writes, Societies have always been shaped more by the nature of the media by which men communicate than by the content of the communication. All media work over us completely. They are so pervasive in their personal, political, economic, aesthetic, psychological, moral, ethical and social consequences that they leave no part of us untouched, unaffected, unaltered. He therefore concludes, the medium is the massage. And I think this redefinition or pun on his original statement certainly seems more apt when applying to works of art. While the medium might not be the message in and of itself, it certainly help, helps sorry, to define and shape it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm quite confused and largely I have lots of questions and I imagine that at the end of it I will be at least as confused as I am at the start. I hope that I'm not going to confuse all of you as well, um, but essentially I'm trying to think or I have been thinking about these terms, the medium, the message. A little bit also about massage. I don't actually use the word massage in this, but I do talk about a warm bath, so maybe that's more or less the same kind of thing. Um, I have no images. There are lots of objects and images here, quite enough, I think. Um, but I was thinking about a couple of examples, um, different kinds of examples from art that um, seem to spur this sort of thinking about what a medium is, what a message is, and what the relationship might be between these two things. So one thing that strikes us about Marshall McLuhan's understanding media is that he doesn't anywhere in it really consider art. Mm -hmm. It's true that he's fond of scattering quotes from literary and poetic greats across his text as a means to emphasise or derive external, extraneous validation for the point he's wanting to make. But he does not actually talk about art itself. Media are understood as extensions of our physical bodies and of their potential for sensuous apprehension of the world around us. We can see further and bigger and smaller our hearing is greatly heightened, our ability to cover ground is massively enhanced, and so on. 
which is to say, it is our interaction with the world and what it has to offer that is in question. If we know anything else about McLuhan, it is that he divided media into two categories, the hot and the cool. Hot media, such as print and film, provide us with lots of information. Cold or cool media offer less information or information of lower quality. Information we have to work at and with in order to find or get the message. TV is perhaps his chief example of this latter sort. But then we need to recall that he was writing in the early 1960s, when the viewer's task of integrating a grainy image with the sounds emanating from an adjacent loudspeaker of similarly low-fi grade was a considerable one. To his credit, he recognised that watching television was not a passive experience. We were all actively involved in constituting a sense of what the TV presented us with. Is the situation very different now, more than half a century later, now that we have high definition images on our very large flat screens and sound bars that deliver pin sharp, dynamically rich sound? Maybe. Though we do get excited when Hito Style writes in praise of the poor image and of how the constant bath in which we swim, that bath of small image files, YouTube videos with their bad sound, thumbnail pictures on our phones and so on, is the defining condition of our contemporary existence. Still then, it seems that lo-fi is not a lack, but a reality. The reality we work in and with and from. What McLuhan concerns himself with is communication, how it is that an idea, a story, a message can be delivered from source to destination and how it is that the means of that delivery cannot merely shape but define what message we think we're receiving. What is the sense of that self that receives and what are the presumptions and expectations of the sender? What production parameters are in operation? Are they given? or is their selection entirely the preference of the sender? Anna has given us a succinct account of McLuhan's thesis in her catalogue essay, and what she also draws our attention to is the affinity between some of McLuhan's ideas and those of Walter Benjamin, in particular Benjamin's view of history as personified in Paul Clay's drawing of the melancholy angel who moves into the future backwards while gazing on horror in horror upon the ruins of the present as they pile up at his feet. Whatever the medium is, perhaps, the history that we understand is part of that. I went with a group of students to see the exhibition of paintings by Bryce Marden, currently on at Gagosian. Ten paintings, each done using a different brand of terre verte. <coughs> the canvases are of consistent dimensions, so in one respect, they're all the same. And yet, of course, they're all distinct and very different one from another. Some more bluish, some greyer, some more yellow, some closer to what you might be comfortable with referring to as just, you know, green. I kept putting the same colour on, the same colour, the same colour. But every time I put it on, it was different. Each time it was this whole new light, colour experience. It was not a revelation, but a whole wonderful new experience. One student said how hard they found abstract painting, which is another way of saying that they had an expectation that the painting was saying something, but that because there was no identifiable image, they could relate to objects around them in the world, that something remained obscure. Where was the answer to be found? The response, which I imagine we have all made many times over the course of our lives, was to suggest that it might help to imagine that the paintings were not saying something. The surfaces of these paintings by Marvin are layered, complex, dense, but not heavy. The marks both catch and radiate light. There are endless modulations, tonal shifts, strokes of light and dark. 
As with those luscious grey paintings in wax and encaustic marble made in the late 60s, their surfaces go all the way down. These paintings do, nevertheless, have titles. They're called simply and pragmatically by the name of the manufacturer of the paint used in their making. There is a reciprocal interconnectedness between the physical fact of each painting, that is, the object in the room with us. The nature of that object as a painting, that is, an object of a kind that is relatable not only to other similarly produced objects, but also to the ways in which we behave around, in the presence of, and in response to such objects. The image of the painting, that inflected rectangle of monochrome paint. The paint by means and out of which that image appears. And the title of the work. The blurb offered by the gallery speaks of this by saying that the medium of the work is also the subject of the works. My preference would be to say that the matter of the works is also their subject matter. They are what they are of, albeit that what they are of is pretty ambiguous. They are of wood and canvas and thinned pigment. They are wood, canvas and thinned pigment. They are of art. They are art. They are art by virtue of the fact that we treat them as art. We put them on the walls of a well-appointed gallery where the door is always open for you by a person of colour. And where the reception desk seems always staffed by young women who are not people of colour. This is not a scientific survey. This is my impression, formed through many years of visiting the gallery in its various venues. We all carry our dissatisfactions and prejudices around with us wherever we go. Already in 1967, Mark <coughs> wrote, the painting process may be repeated several times until I arrive at a colour that holds the shape of the canvas beautifully. What a striking thing to come upon that word, beautifully. There's nothing utilitarian about it, nothing precise. That's not something that can be put in a message and delivered. Here's something beautiful. You mean you think it's beautiful? You find it beautiful? Do you mean that I find it beautiful? Is this Kant speaking, the transcendental imperative? If it's judged beautiful, it ought to be understood as beautiful for everyone. There's coercion there. You ought to find it beautiful. So if that's the message, that's not beautiful. Things are so complicated. Beautiful? I don't know. I do find them endlessly worth the look. I've been there several times and will doubtless find the opportunity to go again before the show closes. You have to work at it yourself, experience it for yourself, find it for yourself. And the context and the baggage will always make a difference. That ghastly floor with its preposterously opulent, wretchedly proportioned planks really does make looking at Michael Andrews or Albert Erlen or Bryce Marden a struggle. What's the medium and what's the message? That this paint made by this manufacturer looks, can look like this, but isn't that the medium? David Harding, who developed the environmental art course at Glasgow School of Art, maintained that the context is half the work. What's the medium? Where is the message? Can we imagine that there might be a message? One of the better known works by Joseph Boyce is a panel on which he has written, written in paint, painted, Das Schweigen von Marcel Duchamp wird überbewertet. The silence of Marcel Duchamp is overrated. The critic Benjamin Buchlow refers to this as a slogan. So perhaps this then might indeed be a message, an artwork with a message. But the words are, as I say, painted, but not evenly or straightforwardly. As it exists now, there are various photographs, pieces of printed paper and other marks collaged onto the surface, and the words appear over, under and around these. The eye of Schweigen is dotted, even though it, like all the other words, is written in uppercase. The letters of Fon 
are much smaller than all the others. Duchamp is underlined, overrated and underlined. And anyway, that painted is perhaps also misleading. The words are done in a mixture of oil and chocolate. It's already hard to see this as just a slogan. Buchlo, in his Art Forum article with a grand Wagnerian Nietzschean title, Twilight of the Idol, is harshly critical of Boyce's tendency to make things represent other things in his work. Then we learn that it was made during and as part of an action performed by Boyce in 1964, coincidentally. There were other objects and materials involved that were characteristic of Boyce's work. A fat corner, some fell, walking sticks. The making of this, what would we call it, placard? This placard occurred as one moment in a 30 minute event. It's a remainder, a leftover, a partial document, a memento, I don't know, a something. What does it mean? What do the words mean? How do they signify? Is there a presupposition that we know who is being referred to by the name Marcel Duchamp? Is it just the name, or is it the person, or is it, in inverted commas, Marcel Duchamp, that moment in art history? Do we want to take Boyce's word for it when he says that he was thinking of the failure of Duchamp to take his gesture of the fountain to its conclusion and to announce that everyone was an artist? Is it saying that Duchamp failed, or is it that Boyce wants to polemicise on behalf of his own artistic agenda? Would we be content to see someone who was unexcited by bicycle wheel or bottle rack or fountain or by the consequences of their appearance for art in the past century latching onto this message of voices to confirm their own feelings? Modern art's a load of rubbish. That's the message. I would not. <clears throat> I wonder about the felt and the fat corner and the walking sticks and about all the other things that might have been present and or occurred during that 30 minutes for which I was not present. I couldn't say what the message was any more than I could say what the medium was. And I think too of Wilhelm Boringer, writing at the time Duchamp was starting to make art. The ideas he lays out in abstraction and empathy seem to bear upon this question of medium and message and of the inextricable interrelation between what we think one of those words refers to and what we imagine the other identifies. Abstraction for Boringer was as much as anything a process, a moving away from a strict representation of things in the world, a realistic rendition of how things appear in our field of vision. What he identifies in this process of abstraction is a detachment of the made forms of the artist from a slavish dependence on the look and literal proportions of things. Abstraction allows for the significance of other dimensions of our existence, of the emotional, the spiritual, the ambiguous, the unresolved. What is freed up is the possibility of acknowledging the generative force of emotion and feeling in the making of work. And equally, what is recognised is that such feeling on the part of the work's maker is not a prescription. It is not itself any kind of message that the work could be understood to be delivering to, be delivering to us or communicating to us. That feeling is the artist's and is for the artist. Whatever it is that we feel, that's for us to discover in our own encounter with what's in front of and around us. I don't think I'd read Marshall McLuhan's book since it was first published in the 1960s. I found a copy of a first hardback edition in the London Library, filed in the back stacks, amongst the books categorised as social science. Would that category have pleased McLuhan? I think so. It would have sounded pleasingly of its moment, his moment, that is. I reread it. Uh, on the train up to Sheffield last week. It's not very long, and it's punctuated, as you probably know, by tellingly arresting images, photographic for the most part, in illustration of his argument. Is it really an argument, though? Does it deserve such praise? Not really. 
McLuhan is a wildly unsystematic thinker. He proceeds by brilliant, reckless aperçus. His statements are pithily expressed and explosively provocative. Many of them are ridiculous and false. He writes, for example, of the railway magically catapulting us back into a world of innocence because it catapults us back into nature so quickly and so readily. Many would have disagreed with that statement. Joan Ruskin, for example, who loathed the noise and the destruction that the railway network wreaked upon the landscape. Or the artist Eugène Boudin, whose paintings of fashionable Parisians freshly arrived on the beaches of Normandy in the 1860s, thanks to the line which took them directly from the heart of Paris. It didn't so much remove them to a world of innocence as enable them to self-preen in a slightly different and more breezier context. And you can see a wonderful example of Bhutan's uh, painting of those fashionable Parisians at the Courtauld Gallery. Others of his statements, on the other hand, do seem uncannily prophetic. It's not difficult to sort the wheat from the chaff. It all boils down to the opposition between the individual and the collective, as all the works of art on, this war, on these wars does too. McLuhan is heralding the advent of the era in which electronic media, electric media, will reign supreme. He evidently finds that word electric, electrifying. What will the electric world bring into being exactly? A new era of collective participation, an age in which we will all once again act as one. As has already been said, he hates the idea of fragmentation, the idea that we're all locked away from each other in our subjective hells or our subjective paradises, as the case may be. Let me read you out just a few of his words so that you get the drift of his highly spasmodic style of thinking. You need to bear in mind that he has a strong antipathy towards the idea of the book, the idea of literacy, the idea of the alphabet, the idea of what he regards as outmoded print technology, the rigid outmodedness of the past. Reading a book is a private affair. It sets one against another, or it seals off one from another. We need to abandon the dangerous luxury of being private individuals. You see, that itself is an extremely dangerous statement. <laughs> Print technology, as Anna mentioned, created the idea of the public. Electric technology, on the other hand, will create the mass. He approves of the idea of the mass. As I read that statement on the train to Sheffield, an image of one of Hitler's Nuremberg rallies of 1935 swum into my ken. Mass collective response to the whims of a mad and murderous demagogue. McLuhan also hymns, and perhaps somewhat envies, the wondrous collective instincts of youth, being not quite so youthful himself, perhaps. The young today live mythically and in depth, he tells us. They live in a brave new world of electronically processed data. Do they? Do they really? He praises the marvellousness of television, which was, as has been said, in its infancy. I appreciate that. Television, he writes, demands participation and involvement in the depth of the whole being. Then, as if by magic, he says something thoughtful and sensible. Citing the death of Kennedy and its blanket coverage by the networks, he writes, television enables a new kind of corporate ritual. It does indeed. Think of the televised funeral of Lady Di, and the outpouring of breast-beating and public misery that sad accident in a Parisian underpass occasioned. Tony Blair, 
ever the master showman caught the mood of the moment. The monarch, on the other hand, remembered the woman, which never helps very much. McLuhan soon turns to stupidity again, or perhaps it is simply an inability to see ahead. The child of the era of television is more earnest, more dedicated, he tells us. He evidently did not live long enough to stare down in despair at random samples of overstuffed couch potatoes with their greasy fingers hooked into the edges of styrofoam boxes brimming with KFC delicacies. <laughs> Here is another example of the wayward, <coughs> on the wing recklessness of his story. <coughs> In late medieval art, he writes, we saw the fear of the new print technology expressed in the theme of the dance of death. Having said that, and without further explanation or ado, his mind gently tiptoes off elsewhere. I'm not quite sure how many interviews he conducted with a range of artists and scribes from the Middle Ages before he drew that firm conclusion. <laughs> A little later, the idea of electric circuitry magically joins hand with the wisdom of Lao Tse. It is orientalizing the West, he airily pontificates. The contained, the distinct, the separate, our Western legacy are being replaced by the flowing, the unified, the fused. Oh, brave new world indeed. <laughs> Unfortunately, the folly of mankind has often interposed itself since then repeatedly. I have dispraised McLuhan quite a lot, but he does raise matters of great importance. And we can feed off him, learn from his mistakes, proceed at a fruitful tangent to his thinking, or borrow from him, even willy-nilly, to our advantage. And I sense that this group is what is what they have all has done as a collective. It is important to consider everything that he says about the op opposition between the public and the subjective, between thinking and feeling, between the personal and the collective impulse. To what extent is the one bad and the other good, as far as you are concerned, as single artists? To what extent can any authentic work of art be coaxed into being as a result of rational calculation? Or must everything be a matter of an instinctive groping ahead through the thrilling dark? Everyone will bring different answers to these questions, and they will do so because we are all in possession of, and this is not something that McLuhan spares any time for, a common humanity. It is for this reason that this past speaks to us all. Thank you very much. So big thanks to all of our speakers. And um, now I have time for thoughts or questions that you'd like to pose either to specific members of the panel or anybody else. Okay. Can I ask you a question of any member of the Magnum Group? Mm. Would, would, you, would you reveal yourself to me? I, I, I feel I don't know you individually. Sir, what's more important, thinking or feeling, when you come to make a great bit of work of art? Feeling. <coughs> How does any work of art begin? Um, it can be a response to anything for me. And then the process um, helps reveal the true nature of the artwork. So it's an intuitive. A lot of it's intuitive. Moving but, ahead. But there has to be like this, uh, there has to be a certain amount of thinking about you know, uh, getting the process on the way. Yeah, so the thinking comes in at, on the way, mm. perhaps. Does anyone work differently from that? It would be quite interesting mm. to hear other approaches, because we all work differently. I mean, I hope that there is a relationship between the work but each artist has their own methods. Anyone got anything else to add to that? Because I, for example, 
um, work a bit differently from Gary, even though I think our works do relate well. I, I, um, I see the whole thing first as an image. In fact, I, I choose a photograph that's reflecting the feeling that I have. So that's uh, my research will work that way. And then when I've got the photograph, I'll distort it and play with it and change it till it's more extreme and even more precisely goes with what I'm feeling. So how do you work with um, the photograph? Um, basically, I'll put it on a photocopier and I'll distort it, right. so it'll stretch the image, twist the image, and I'll collage it as well. So I might use a body of a man, a head of a woman, uh, the fist of another man. I'm, I'll sort of, it's not really a person, I'm sort of creating a person that I think reflects what the message I'm trying to get across, which is to do with the feeling and to do with an idea. And, and then it will become a painting, but it's through the paint that the thing does actually change. And that's where I feel I relate more with what Gary's just said, mm. that then it becomes, afterwards for me, it becomes <coughs> intuitive, because the medium sort of dictates really a lot how the result looks. That bit I can't predict. And does the medium is the message or the mass mean anything to you, really? Does it? Yeah, does because... Has it been a guiding light in some way? No, guiding light. <laughs> I was kind of taking issue, actually, with McLuhan for saying um, that the medium is the message that is more important than the content, um, and then Benjamin sort of saying this, the same kind of thing that you know it's, the content doesn't matter so much. Because I was thinking, well, for a lot, a lot of artists, and certainly the Magma Group, the content does matter. That's the idea. The content is the idea because mm. you know the group's been selected for artists who have a strong idea that comes through in their work, is expressive about it, and plays with the medium sort of quite sensitively. So it's kind of all those things. But I agree, I think it was this Michael <laughs> that said that McLuhan isn't really talking about fine art very much. I mean, he does touch on it with, to do with, he's very selective, he goes cubism, because that kind of helped him say what he wanted to say that's anyway, right. that you, you're surrounded by it because it's looked at from all angles. But that's just cubism. So I was thinking, hey, but what about us and how we work? So I was um, daring. I was ca cautioned by people, you know, don't touch McLuhan. But no one was sort of totally precious, you know? Well, I think I mean, what Michael said, and I think it's probably what I, he, I said to Rebecca in the first email that I said, I said was, the thing that strikes you when you're reading McLuhan is this way that he just kind of dots around. There's no consistent sort of flow of a thought or an argument being constructed. It's just one thing kind of next to another, and it's very sort of flighty, sort of protean kind of feel to the whole thing. Um, and it's much, and it, reading him is as much as anything a kind of a, a task of sort of feeling your way and, and sort of maybe discovering a bit of grit somewhere that, that you can kind of yeah. make something of. Yeah. He's good at slogans. Hmm? He is good at slogans. He yeah, is good at slogans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it just came to me when I was thinking, you know, Rebecca was saying, come up with a, an interesting idea, please. And, and it did come to me, the medium and method. I thought, hey, I don't know where it came from even. It just popped in my mind. Because that's the power of, of his slogan. Mm. So it's just there in the ether. Um, has anyone got any questions they'd like to ask any of the speakers? Or other artists that have got like to comment further on what Michael Glover was saying. I've sort of got some thoughts on that, my depth thing is, but it does seem to me that one of the things that needs clarifying is, is what the medium is. Um, I, my, my small understanding of McLuhan was that the medium is the message, was a kind of tautology, if you like, um, and that the medium is all of its possibilities that we live in and therefore was kind of a message. And that's true of all media, so that we, we, we are what all the media messages make of us in our interactions with them. Um, and that, that seems to me to have nothing to do with content as per se. Content is content is content. But the structural possibilities of media and new media is what takes us forward. And I thought, I thought there was something kind of in that, but uh, that's as far as I go. It's odd because you, if you read if you read all the way through understanding media, he says it a lot, but actually he doesn't tell you what he, he means by it. Either. 
kind of have to get that out of it, don't we? There is a there's a kind of sense in which what like a new medium would would as it were deliver you something else. So like a film would deliver you the novel or something like that. So the mediums, uh, but there's also a sense of you know like the standard kind of early critique of the structure of rate of television programs like the news it'll give you the main stories then it'll give you a sort of a sub story then there'll be a break and then they'll come back and there'll be some kind of local things and then there'll be the cat up the tree and then it'll all be fine and it'll be the end so whatever dreadful things are going on in the world essentially the news is that you're okay yeah? <laughs> that's so the medium is is structured in a way that will give you you know, and it doesn't matter like which particular politician is talking to which other politician. It's just the sense of that. Um, I remember also in some of his writings about postmodernism, uh, the critic, the literary critic Frederick Jameson, was talking about an installation by Nam June Pipe, which had I think it was a TV garden. So there are lots of potted plants and lots and lots of coloured TVs everywhere, all over. And he says, which is kind of true, it doesn't really matter what's playing on the screens. You don't sit and look at the screens. What, what you get is the flicker and the colour and the light and being in this space. And so that's, that's another sense in which the medium might be the message, I think. You get a sense that he's always, he's, he's hurtling towards the future as fast as he can go. Yeah. Having joined the hands of every young woman he can find. Um, <laughs> but actually, most of you are, are, are painters using an ancient medium. So, you know, this seems to be somewhat at odds with the idea of McLuhan's hurtling to reference to the future. Um, I, I started to wonder, for me, um, message seemed to become moral as well. You know, to sort of say the medium is the message then makes it sound like one thing. Like there's only one thing expressed in literature or painting or sculpture or whatever, whereas really in the real sense of being an artist, it's many, many messages, it's many thoughts, it's many emotions, it's many, it's layers of things. So actually, on reading it, I just found it very, I suppose that's why he doesn't talk about art. I thought it was interesting that he chose Cubism, which is about multiple perceptions and multiple points of view. And yet he doesn't, he doesn't really take it, he just says, here's Cubism, and then he darts off. And I suppose that's why I took, the, I'm the person who made that, so that's about Cubism, and I picked that word up, and I thought, oh, okay, let's see what happens with Cubism in painting, but in sculpture, sorry. But I, I see it as a very, as an artist, I just see him as taking one thing and one idea, and then he goes with it, and then he darts around, but as an artist, I see it much more sort of like a multi-layered, mm. multimedia cake. <coughs> so it's got savoury bits, it's like a horrible cake of savoury and salt and pepper and all sorts of things. I think maybe that's, um, as it were, a, a good reason for us to take the word massage as well as message mm. then, because it's as much that, I think, really, that he's talking about. It's just, just like that's the, the environment that we're because yeah. if you look at anyone in the works in this exhibition does it have a message and does it if there is a message is it the message that the artist has in mind if the artist has a message in mind is it the message that the viewer receives is it the message that is communicated between the two is it does each viewer have a different you know receive a different message or interpretation so again it's yeah the massage idea kind of bits that everyone might be being pushed or nudged in certain directions, but not reaching the same end point. But that is um, just what you're saying. That's um, often of quite interest to an artist. If you talk to people, which you do often at private view, and people ask them about the work, and then they say, oh, like, so with my painting, I'd say, I, I, I wondered if it was an angel. I wondered if those white areas were wings. And I never thought of that. Mm. So, um, and then I told them what it actually was meant to be. But I quite like that. Um, and I know from speaking <coughs> to some of the other artists, people often quite like that that's open to interpretation because that's just interesting, isn't it? And it doesn't, 
you know, it doesn't have to, the painting doesn't have to give the answer you want it to. You, you might want people to pick up um, on, what, on what you're trying to deliver, but I also think it's interesting, you know, the discourse, as it were. How does this make them work as a group? Hmm? How does it work? Hmm. Do you have discussions about these things amongst yourself? Um, to be honest, we probably have, I, I certainly have lots of one to one discussions with the different artists. Um, because I kind of put the... I just wonder to what extent you're a collective endeavour. We're, we're not a typical collective, or I'd atypical say. Collective. Huh? I'd say we're an atypical <laughs> collective. <laughs> because we're not kind of um, a group who, are, who already knew each other and right. so organically sort of coalesced into, into a group. Um, well, we're, we're quite focused in terms of, you know, we'll work towards an exhibition. The magma sounds hot and close to me. Hot and close. <laughs> <laughs> we, we chose the word because magma is like, you know, this, this hot fluid that like exactly. explodes, which is basically what the work's about to some extent. Yeah. I'd like to just say something in relation to what you said earlier um, um, about the um, kind of leaving the, 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 the meaning to the, to the, to the viewer. In, I did a workshop with some children um, a couple of weeks ago and I showed them one of my paintings and asked them what they could see in the picture and lots of them came up with all these amazing ideas about like they could see like, I don't know, like a boat and sort of like various animals and, um, and uh, yeah, like all, all kinds of different things and I was like, oh, it's amazing, they're, they're so creative and they, they have all their own, their own ideas and they don't care what, what it's about and then this one kid said, um, that's just like a bunch of lines and shapes and colours. And I'm like, yeah, but that's <laughs> what it is. And I thought that was a really nice kind of like synopsis of kind of like art and how to perceive Clearly it. Clearly a theorist. So it's very good. Yeah. 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 I once had a child ask me to tell, tell them a story of a particular piece of work. And so I started a story and the child said, no, that's not my story. I sometimes think that there, that there's a lot of verbiage that gets slipped away when it comes down to oh, this kind of make things. And there's not a lot to be said, there's I a lot of dancing around it. Couldn't but, agree more. Um, you do the chatting afterwards. Well, yeah, I mean, I, the number, I mean, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but and I'm not really part of this, this, <laughs> this group, but the number of times I've heard the things said about materials and media, um, it, it just seems that it's the same wheel going around a lot of the time. That people play with media and, and there's a sort of hierarchy of artists more or less successful, but the words that come out of their mouths are, are very often the same. Mm -hmm. they, they use media, they push it around on the surfaces, and they call it art, and somebody over there's doing it, somebody over there's doing it, long conversations about it. And it kind of seems to go on forever. It makes no sense, but... Uh, <coughs> it helps us pass the time. Sorry? It helps us pass the time. Oh, no. <laughs> I know, but I kind of get off the wheels. <laughs> when you mentioned this very which is, which is probably what you referred to, um, <coughs> to theoretical talk, um, there, there was for years and years a cam campaign for plain English, mm -hmm. especially in legal matters and parliamentary talk and so on. So it seems like it is high time to introduce plain English in, into artistic language. If you, if you read uh, freeze bulletins or something of, the, of, of that nature, it is just absolutely mind-boggling what kind of uh, juggling of uh, uh, exceptional, ex exceptional kind <laughs> one has to experience. And, and, and it is, after all, when artists, uh, uh, as it has been said, approach the painting or sculpture or whatever medium, which until today when one feels a form submitting a work, the medium, it's usually quite clearly specified. Sculpture, painting, oil, watercolour, all this, plus all the baggage which 
makes the work what it is, is a medium. So maybe in, 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 in modern uh, applications of, of multimedia culture that we are living in, where we rapidly have to examine whether our uh, wall paintings are still relevant, um, this, this medium is what we are actually conveying. I think what really counts is the excitement of the wordless encounter, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's really important. And yet the job of the art critic is to put it into words. Redundant. Hmm? Redundant. Really? <laughs> Made myself redundant, you mean? Huh? Made myself redundant. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's to respond, maybe. Mm. Like, what, what, is, yeah, what is one's response in the presence of the work? Well, that's not an explanation, that's not a recasting of it, it's just, it's an interaction. It can be very nice for an artist who, whose, whose main tools are not words, I find, to to have people who are good with words put what you're trying to do into words. I, I often find that really helpful because I think that is what I'm trying to do, but I personally wouldn't come up with mm. you know, that explanation. So I think there is a real purpose for mm. critics. The only trouble yeah, is sometimes we can't. Oh yes, really. <laughs> well, that's, that's <laughs> just an honest uh, thought. But. So is there any more questions? or? or points of view you want to put across. Um, there is more wild mild wine, is that right? I believe so. Mm. Might not be so hot. Though. Might not be so hot by now. <laughs> Might be some <coughs> mince pies left or are they finished? Yeah, there's loose loose. Really? <laughs> would, would our wonderful, um, knowledgeable speakers um, <coughs> put themselves on the line and actually comment on some of the pictures. I am not the exhibitor here, so I <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, uh, some years ago I was in Venice and um, Leon Kossoff was showing at the British Pavilion. I think I would say just one thing. I mean, what, what appealed to me when I looked at the brochure was that I thought you all shared a tremendously engaging surface energy, the real pulsing energy of the surface of the work. Mm -hmm. That really pulled me in. That's why I wanted to come and see you. That's good thing. Thank you. I think the thing I would say is that um, seeing them, having seen, not that I saw all of them in advance as JPEGs, but having seen JPEGs by the artists, even if it was different works, then seeing the actual works, whether that speaks for for the medium or for, I don't know what it speaks for, but there is a, definitely a difference between seeing the actual work and the experience you get from that and from just seeing JPEGs or print versions. I think there's a real call to actually get out there and well, go and see the works, as, as Michael said. And I was very interested in your book, particularly uh, uh, Professor Archer, about the, uh, the references Bryce Marvel, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. uh, as a sort of counterpoint, really, mm -hmm. to the message mm -hmm. and the fact <coughs> that paintings don't speak. I thought that reference is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to kind of ponder over that. There was another quote of his that I had, mm -hmm. and I wondered whether I would put it in, and then I decided not to. But he was talking about mm -hmm. his paintings from the 60s. Um, He'd been um, he'd come over from New York to France, mm. and he was walking around Paris, and um, he saw people repairing 
lots of walls. Mm. It's still really sort of after the war, the end of the war. You watch plasterers plastering a surface and seeing the drips falling down and them just not worrying about it because they wanted to make the mm. wall. Mm. And mm. so that thing that you see in his paintings with that dribble at the bottom, that's the kind mm. of direct take from that experience. Mm. And then he was talking about the making, discovering the colour, the grey colour, as he was making those paintings. And, and he talked of it as being like a hedge, something that hides something that is there, but mm. it's not going to tell you what it is. But actually in doing that, asserts mm. its presence, its own presence in mm. the space of you. Mm. So that's the thing that you're looking at, mm. not wondering what's going on mm. over there. It's about reading the work in which case, isn't it? And, and the variable readings that you can take from it yeah. as opposed to the, the message necessarily being embodied in the work. Mm. And I, I don't know whether that's what the intention is about embodying your message in the paintings here, as opposed to the intention being that in, in a sense it doesn't have any message. The message is something which is referred or reflected in the viewer and the reader. The reader can actually then own the message, if you like, in that sense. I mean, I don't know what you'd say about that, but I imagine that it's, yeah. it's much more to do with, with finding the message or bringing the message out rather than putting something in. Mm. It's the work that, in its making, is, is mm. the thing that's realising the, the mm. message and the possibility of any kind of because images are non-phonetic, aren't they, in that sense? They don't speak, in the mm -hmm. same. Mm -hmm. they, um, they're heard and they're read. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not even heard, but they're seen and they're read. Um, so it's, a, it's an intentional, it's about the intention of it, which I find interesting. It's the intention about the message, was it? To provide a, a sounding board, if you like, for other people to <coughs> interpret or run with, them, with that reading that they may have. And what's the impact of that on the person and the individual? You know, and how do you feel about it? There's always that kind of that sort of <coughs> balance or relationship between something like, well, it's just some colours and some lines and some shapes, like it's mm. um, you know sort of like Paul Quare in the early 20th century um, using um, young girls to sort of do his designs for him, his fashion designs, because they had a certain kind of innocence that he sort of. Mm. which he praised or whatever mm. but also you know like we learn what a skull and crossbones mean we learn what a police tape mm. thing means so we actually can become quite mm. quite practiced in different kinds of languages mm. and how images work and how signs and icons and so on so all of that mm. is playing mm. anyway I'd like to read it okay. <coughs> that would be great to yeah to see the the text, but also we've uh, videoed tonight, so we'll be, um, with the permission of the speakers, if we get their permission, we'll put the video onto the Magna Group website, uh, Re Rebecca's welcome to have it if she would like, and we'll be posting it on social media, so you you could hear it again, but I think it obviously does help to read it, read it because quite texts are quite complex. Um, Unless, of course, you're of McLuhan's. Hmm? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody like some wine or piece of pies? Please just yeah. come back to that.